Really is equal to the force, the cosine, what's parallel to it, times the distance. And this leads to a change in kinetic energy. This is the work energy theorem. That work leads to a change in kinetic energy. Okay? All right. Then, and, well, actually, we should put the network here. The network here. Okay, so let's start with that idea. If I push something, okay, if I push something at a constant velocity, okay, slide a block with constant velocity along a horizontal like this. It's going at a constant velocity. Constant velocity. Did its kinetic energy change? All right. Kinetic energy. One half mv squared. If I'm going at a constant velocity, does my kinetic energy change? No. So therefore, no network was done. But then you're going, wait a minute. You're applying a force to something and sliding it along. You're doing force times distance equals work. Correct. But it's the network equals the change in kinetic energy. What's working against it? The friction. And between my sliding with a constant velocity and friction pushing back with a, con with, with a constant force and so that there's no acceleration, the friction does. In other words, I might have done 100 joules of work but friction did a hun negative 100 joules of work, so the net work is zero joules, so there's no change in my kinetic energy. Does that make sense? Okay. Took me 20 years to figure that out. You guys are good, all right? I would always just, the way I got through physics, be honest, I'd hide behind the math. I'd just trust the math because I was good at math, and, and I had maybe had no idea physically what was going on, but I kind of knew how to manipulate equations. So, I mean, I understand it's a separate entity, but does it run parallel with friction? I mean, this... Okay, all right, here's the deal. <laughs> Let's say I apply a 50 Newton force for two meters, okay? So I'm applying a 50 Newton force for 2 meters times 2d, but my 50 cosine of 0 times 2 equals 100 joules. Friction, on the other hand, since my free body diagram looks like this, 50 newtons, negative 50 newtons equals my uh, force of kinetic friction, okay? So this guy is pushing with um, 50 times the cosine of 180 times 2. So he's negative 100 joules. Parallel indeed. Different wrong direction, no. He's going this way and the displacement's going that way, so it's negative. Does that make sense? So, when we throw the softball, softball's coming in with a kinetic energy, whoosh, and you stop it, you're definitely um, changing its kinetic energy from a whole bunch to a little bit, to nothing, right? And so, um, you did work. What's that? Brakes on a car? Perfect. Good example. Let's do one with brakes on a car, okay? In fact, I think you have, have you been doing your homework problems? Okay, because you got one, you got a homework problem like that. So let's do it. Let's, 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 uh, okay. Well, this one's a little bit different. <laughs> I mean, but it's the same concept with the Oh, that's a whole different ball game. You're getting into rotation. Okay. All right. First of all, be careful because when you start talking about cars and stuff like that, you also have rotational energy. And when you're talking about the internal energy of something going on, the disc brakes and all that kind of stuff, that's internal rotational energy. Whole different ball game. We're looking at the big mechanical system on the outside. All right. But let's take a look at one of your homework problems. Here it is, problem 30. This is one of your homework problems. Um, so this is the first big idea. 
Let's take a look at one of your homework problems. It says here that I've got a 1,200 kilogram automobile. Mass is 1,200 kilograms. Automobile. Reminds me of a Max Box 20 song, but anyway. Um, and it travels. V is going 90. This is almost like the softball stop it. 90 kilometers per hour which when I multiply that by 1,000 meters divided by 3,600 seconds, a little conversion here comes out to be 25 meters per second, okay? When I had to get my Okinawan driver's license, we, one of the things that we had to do was convert kilometers per hour to miles per hour. And basically, it's real easy to do. What you do is you have this and add 10% and you wind up with the miles per hour in case you ever have to take the Okinawan driving test. All right. You never know when that's going to happen. All right. Anyway, so, so at UMKC, we prepare you for all things. All right, so now, it's going, it goes from zero, this is the final velocity, to the initial velocity. Okay? All right. Zero to that fast. All right? So now, it says this. It says, what is the kinetic energy of this thing? Well, what's its kinetic energy? Kinetic energy is what? What's the formula for that? Right. There's your kinetic energy. Okay. So, that's not too bad. We get one-half times 600 times uh, 25 squared. And this, oh, I had already took the one-half. I'm doubly. So this equals 600 times 625, and that equals 375,000. What's the unit for energy? Joules. Okay, you chemists, it's not calories or kilocalories right now. It's, we're in joules. You're in a real science. Okay, no, I'm kidding. Anyway. Okay, it's joules. All right. Chemists are just physicists who don't like math. It's the only difference. All right, now, 375 joules, all right? So, um, I thought James was going to ask this question. All right, so what about the braking? If I'm going at, three, if I'm going at 25 meters per second and I want to come to a stop, how many joules of energy do I need to provide to bring me to a halt? 375,000. 375,000, if Robin put that in, in ma Mastering Physics, it would say, wrong, check your sign. Negative. Negative, right. Negative 375,000 joules would be required to bring this thing to a stop. Um, but would the, wouldn't the final velocity be zero? No, it went from zero to this. It's, this thing's actually accelerating. Now I'm talking about when, oh, when we bring it to a stop. So that's how fast we got it. So now this is its velocity, but to bring it to a stop, do you all see that? Why it would take negative 375 joules to bring it to a stop? Yeah, it's going in the opposite direction. So, and, it, and does it ask us what network would be required? Oh, that was the next question. What network would be required to bring it to a stop? Negative 375 joules. How, what's the acceleration? Now, here's a good question. Here's a good question. What acceleration would be required to bring this to a stop in 50 meters? Let's say D equals 50 meters. We want to stop it in 50 meters. Can we figure out the acceleration that would be needed? Two ways to do it. You could go, well, yeah, because I've got good old VF squared equals V naught squared minus 2AX. And you've told me everything. You've told me the 50. You've told me this will be... Uh, 25, this is zero. I can do it that way. This guy's going to show up if I use the energy way, too. Or I can go, well, wait a minute. Robin told me that force times distance equals negative 375,000 joules. Okay? And I can go, aha! The force is mass times acceleration. In this case, it would be deacceleration. But anyway, we'd go, oh, MA 
times D. We're going mad, all right? And equals negative 375, 375,000 joules. And so we'd wind up with A equals um, 375,000, negative 375,000 joules over 1,200 times 50. There, so it's kind of tied in. And let's see if that, now, I'm kind of winged this little part of the lecture here because um, the idea just hit me to do this, which is very dangerous. You should never do physics on the fly, especially when it's being broadcast to millions. All right? Divided by 1,200 times 50. That's negative 6.25 meters per second. A equals negative 6.25 meters per second squared. Let's see if that'll work for this guy where we've got 0 equals 25 squared uh, minus 2a times 50. So I've got, uh, ooh, it's going to work. I love it when a plan comes together. Look. We're stopping. We're stopping. We're stopping. Okay? So I'm going to go 2a times 50 equals 625. Oh my gosh, look at this. 625 divided by 100 equals 6.25. It worked. And we, are, we factored the negative up here. Ta-da! I love it when a plan comes together. So it, either way, I like doing the energy thing because it's much easier normally. Okay, now. Right, I, I've already taken, well, if I did it this way, if I actually used the actual formula, had a plus sign there, what do I get here? I get a negative there. I had already factored it out. So, yeah, I just have to remember that. Oh, I've already factored that out. So, the, so the magnitude, oh, that's the other thing. This guy pretty much gives you magnitudes, okay, because we're squaring things, all right? Okay, so, now let's talk a little bit about potential energy, gravitational potential energy. All right, we had three energies that we've talked about so far. Uh, we had one-half mv squared. Which one's this one? Kinetic. Kinetic. Which one's this one? One-half kx squared. What do we call that? It's the spring guy, right? Yeah, oh yeah, and it's variable force. Robin's going, yeah, it's a variable force. She's trying to keep all this stuff together. It's a variable force. It's the spring constant. Yeah, it's not tension. It's not tension. Um, actually, <laughs> well, in the real world, yes, it is. It has a lot to do with tension, but we don't, we simplify it, so. This is the spring, this is the elastic potential energy, what we call elastic. Well, I'm not going to call it EPE because if I call it EPE, that gets into electric potential energy, which we'll talk about next semester. Elastic potential energy. In other words, if my spring is slack, if I got a, if I got a slinky here, oh, I got a slinky down my office, but anyway, if it's slack, if this is sitting there, um, is it, is there any potential for it to do work if, it, if the spring is slack, it's not stretched out in any way? No, it can't do any work, right? It's just like, it's just like, um, let's say zero is here. My calculator's down there. Is it ready to do any work? Can it fall? Well, I guess if I cut a hole in the floor, it'd fall down to the next level, right? But it's, it can't, it doesn't have any potential to do any work. But if I bring it up here, now it's got potential. It's got the gravitational potential, which is mgh, which is the mass times the gravitational times the height. Now, the elastic potential energy, if I smush it, you've got to be careful now with your homework assignments because k, what was k in? What units? That's your spring constant. What units is that? It's 
newtons per meter, okay? It's newtons per meter. Just like when you put the cantaloupe in the basket in, in, in the, on the scale at the supermarket, that spring's gonna stretch like an inch, put four pounds in there, it stretches one inch, then that spring constant is four pounds per inch. We do newtons per meter, okay? But be careful because your homework gives you all those distances are in centimeters. In fact, they asked for the answer on one of them is in centimeters too, okay? Because I did one of the problems and I got 0 .07. I put 0 .07 in and they said, you're an idiot. And I went, ugh, what's wrong? And then I saw at the end, oh, it's in centimeters. So I quickly multiplied by 1,000 and I said, you're an idiot again. I went, oh, yeah. I said, I'm not going from grams to kilograms, I'm going centimeters to meters multiplied by 100, and I finally got the right answer. Okay. All right, so, so in the spring constant, K is in newtons per meter, kind of a little review from Tuesday, and this is the gravitational potential energy. Now, let's talk about conserving, conserving energy, all right? Here's the big idea behind everything. The E at the beginning is equal to the mechanical energy at the end. If everything's conserved. And something is conserved, we have conservative forces. One of the conservative forces that we have is gravity. It's a conservative force. In other words, its changes in energy do not depend upon the path. So, Let's say this thing has a GPE right here of 10 joules, okay? When I raise it up to here, it's now got a gravitational potential energy of 12 joules. So 10, 12. If I go 10, kind of wing it around, up, over, drop it, bring it back, but now I bring it back to 12, what's its change in gravitational potential energy? Still 2 joules. It didn't matter that I moved it all over the place. However, with non-conservative forces, like, say, this table, and I start pulling on it with friction, it matters how much energy, it matters on the path. In other words, I gotta do work going this way, I'm doing work, you know, I'm changing the energy going this way, it matters the path, because it's pulling against it all the time, okay? Gravity's just going in one direction. It doesn't care. So by the time you do all the algebra, it's just, it's conserved. It's just kept it at the same. Regardless, your beginning is equal to your end. All right, now, what's that? Oh, that's him out there talking. <laughs> okay, now, let's, let's talk about conservative forces then. And a great problem for this, and for some reason it wasn't on Wiley Plus, but I liked it. And so I couldn't put it, or not Wiley Plus, we're doing Mastering Physics. Wiley Plus is the other one. So, well let me finish one idea first. This. So, here's, here's the algorithm. I hate teaching things algorithmically. I, I want you to kind of get the essence of it. But, we've got little time. So this is your, okay? So this is all my E naught, okay? And this is my final energy of a system. All right. And that's my final energy of a system, okay. So, let's take a look, keeping this idea in mind. You'll know that energy is being conserved in a problem, if you're given a problem, and they don't give you a mass. You'll go, oh, energy is being conserved, because w w what about, or, or it, and they definitely won't give you a spring problem, because what about the masses, if I didn't have the springs in here, if I just had, with no springs, um, if I just had that one half mb squared and the mgh, you can see that the masses all cancel, okay? And then I wind up with my equations from kinematics. Yes, James? Um, on the one half, mdf, 
Why is that not squared? Because I did that on purpose to see if anyone would notice. Okay. All right. There we go. Good. All right. Now, so let's take a look at this roller coaster problem. This roller coaster looks like this. Okay, here's a point B, here's a point C, and here's my roller coaster. And it's got an initial velocity of 5 meters per second. This is 5 meters high, this is 8 meters high. Now, there's two parts to this question. This is a great little test question. One, what will be its final speed? What's its final speed? Notice when we're talking energy, we use speed. We use scalars because we're talking energy. Energy is scalars. All right. What would be its final speed at B? And will it make it to C? Those are two great questions. Okay. First of all, we all know that if, it, if we just gave it a little tap, if this, if this initial velocity was zero, and we just gave it a little tap, would it make it up to C? In other words, if its initial velocity was zero and it just started rolling down, would it make it up to C? No. No, it would not. But maybe with, an extra, with a little push, it go whoosh, at five meters per second, it might make it. Now, if you're given a problem, I guarantee you, you might see one. It might be a bobsled because I don't really like doing roller coasters. Why? Because they have wheels and there's translational, in, there's rotational energy involved there too. But, and there's also heat being given off and everything else. But anyway, if you're given a problem that looks like this, um, it might be a bobsled type thing. If you ever wind up with your final velocity or an, a velocity where you go V squared equals some negative number, guess what? You're trying to take the square root of a negative number, so it's not going to make it. That's a tip-off that you're violating the laws of physics, man, as Scotty used to say. Okay? All right. So, here we go. Let's try this. Let's, first of all, we've got two problems. Final velocity at B. That's the first one. Second question is, will it make it to C? given that initial velocity of 5 meters per second. Well, let's see. The final velocity of B, that's not hard. You just do this equals this. Okay? And so at B, first of all, is there any elastic potential here in this problem? No. Now, you might see a problem where you've got a bobsled that comes down a steep hill, kind of goes up a hill, and then it'll go with no friction along a thing, and then run into a spring. And you might have to figure out the spring constant of the spring or something at the end of all that. That would be a great, okay, there you go. So think about that. <laughs> all right, so now, so we've, got, uh, so we've got this. So let's do this. So in other words, we're going to break, we're going to do the first half. One half mv squared, we've got one half of five squared plus mg times five. And we don't have to worry about these guys. So to do this problem, we just go, oh, okay. I've got 1 half times m times 5 squared plus mg times 3, 5. Equals, at the bottom here, what's the, what's the gravitational potential energy here? What's mgh at the bottom? Zero, right. Okay, now... I could have said that this is 105 meters and this is at 100 meters. That's a legal move. And so this would ha actually have a relative gravitation. Okay, I'm going to over explain something and confuse you. But anyway, do you see that if, if this is 105 and this is 100, it's the same thing as if this is 5 and this is 0? And it's the same thing as if this was negative 15 and this is negative 20? That when it's all said and done, 
it's going to work out to be the same as uh, 0 and 5. And like the differences, the difference in the gravitational potential energy between this and this is just 3. I can, I can reset this as 0 and make this 3. Hal's shaking his head. He's going, you lost him. No? Okay, we're good? All right. Do you all see that? That, it's, that it doesn't matter. It's your zero reference point that you pick. It's up to you. For this first part, I'm going to use zero and five. I'm not going to do 105 and 100. That'd be silly. No need to. Okay? So, we got this. It equals, so down at the bottom, you all said it's got zero gravitational potential, so it's just got MVF squared. Ta-da! Now, let's go through. We can boing, boing. I love division with variables because there's no numbers to worry about. It's not like 7 divided by 3. I hate that fraction. I, never, I have no idea what it is. Okay. And then um, multiply everything by 2. And I'm going to get 5 squared plus 2g times 5 equals vf squared. Boy, what does this look like? Yeah, we've seen this before. Right? In our old kinematics. It's the same thing. It's a half price store. It's the same thing. So we got 25 plus, wow, 19 times 5. That's about 100 equals VF squared. So I'm going to say VF equals 15. You can do that when you're king. It's, you can just kind of round that 19.6 times 5. Yeah, it's 100. Then you get 125, and you get a perfect square. The square root of 125 is it 15? No, that's 225. You're right. Gosh dang it. What's the square root of 125? Oh. 11. Dang. My afternoon class let me get away with that. 225 is 15 squared, by the way, in case you're wondering. <laughs> Broadcast to millions. To millions. Okay, now. Okay, now let's do the second part. Now the second part, I could start down here and say it's got one half MVF, change this to my V naught, but we're dealing with energy. I don't need to do that. I just want to know the difference in energy from here and here. If, if to get it up here takes a lot more energy than what I've got here, then I'm not going to make it. Okay? And so the minimum that I would need, I'd have to be going some, I'd have to have zero would have to be right here and then we'd start going down. So this energy level would be MGH at 8. But I can make it at 3 if I wanted. Right? Because I'm going to reset this to be 0, and this is now at 3. I'm changing my 0 reference because I'm doing a different problem. I can do that. If I had 5 and 8, it would still work out the same. So I'm going to make that MG3. This is my E final. And my E initial is uh, 1 half M times 5 squared. So my 5's cancel. Oh, I'm just seeing if these two are equal to each other. That's right. My, my M's cancel. And I've got 25 over 2. Does that equal uh, 9.8 times 3? Are those two equal at all? No, they're not. One's 30 and one's about 12. This has three times as much energy up there. Okay. Now. With your homework problems and with your quiz that we're going to take here in a few minutes, be careful. Be careful with um, things like, okay, let's say something has uh, mass equals the mass. I've got two objects, object one and object two. Their masses are the same, but this guy, object two, has twice the velocity, twice the velocity. How much greater is his kinetic energy? 
Ah! That's what we want you to say. So that we can count it wrong and discourage you from ever taking another science class again. Okay? We love doing that. We like our numbers small. Because then we don't have to deal with people. Okay? All right? But no. Actually, we're not doing it. But anyway, what is that? So what would it be? Think again. You're squaring that velocity. So how much more energy do you have if it's double? What's 2 squared? 4. So if it's triple, how much more energy does it have? 9 times, right. Okay. And if it's 4 times, it'd be 16. You know, all that. Now, the gravitational potential energy differences are linear. In other words, if it's double the height, then it's got double the gravitational potential energy because it's this MGH. That's just a nice linear relationship. Why this is four times? Okay, let's write it out. Let's, let's stop doing thought puzzles and actually see it. Okay, so this guy's kinetic energy, for one, is one-half mv squared. Okay? Let's do it this way. One half mv squared. Put it on the outside there. This guy, the kinetic energy for uh, this guy for two is one half m two v squared. Okay? So his kinetic energy is um, one half m times 4 v squared. Okay? And you might be going, ah, wait a minute. We can cancel the 2 and the 4. Uh-huh. Look. Looky, looky. It's only double. Uh-uh. That's 4 times bigger than this. If I have $2, that's 4 times bigger than 50 cent piece, right? Okay, same thing. Okay, so that's kind of typical type of problem that you'll have. Let, um, let's see. Let's see. What, um, okay, we had the roller coaster. Did I give? I think I gave you problems forty-five and forty-six. They're nice little problems. Okay. All right. Here we go. I'm sorry. I, I lost my mind there for a minute. Okay. Let's, in fact, to, to kind of tie this all together and to give you, uh, I forgot to bring what your problems are with me, which was bad. That wasn't a good thing. All right. Uh, Let's do a problem here that's kind of tricky, okay? Um, in fact, let's do, I'm going to do problem 74 and 76 from your book, all right? If you can follow along with what 74 and 76 are doing, we're, we'll take about 10 minutes to do these real quick. And then I think everything, and then I think we've pretty much got everything besides that first part that I gave you where Force times distance equals work as long as that force is parallel to the thing. Okay. But I like dealing with the work energy, kinetic energies, and, and all that kind of stuff so that you see how things are. Now, energy is something an object has. As a matter of fact, next semester, at the end of next semester, we get into all the cool relativity stuff where Einstein showed that something's mass depends on its, its energy and mass are the same thing, right? Good old E equals MC squared, most famous equation of all time. Okay, he's saying, hey, energy and mass are, are r related to each other. Okay, um, so anyway, here we go. We've got a spring, okay, attached like this, 
and we got a spring down here like this now what we're going to do is we got a little block here that's 0.1 kilograms and we're going to depress this spring 10 centimeters and we're going to send this block flying up in the air and it's going to smack into this spring and depress it two centimeters okay and the distance between these two is 30 centimeters what's K in the spring there are two identical springs what's K oh my goodness I read this by the way you gotta be kidding me this looks hard but it's not bad because we're going to break it down into the two energies okay so basically what we're going to do is we're going to smash this spring down 10 centimeters boing send that block flying up in the air okay now it doesn't basically what happens is the the way we've constructed the problem is we're going to let the block um, it's going to depress tense well wait if it's an ideal spring aha it's going to we're going to depress it 10 centimeters then the block is not going to release this thing until it's up here at 10 centimeters because it's an ideal spring it's not going to lose any energy so in other words if I smash it down 10 centimeters how far is it going to shoot up 10 centimeters and it should just keep doing that forever but that's if it's an ideal spring okay and then this spring is going to get depressed two centimeters we want to figure out what the spring constant is okay all right so here's what we do we're going to we're going to depress <laughs> you all are probably depressed by now anyway okay we're going to depress the spring a let's call this a and this b uh 10 centimeters let's figure out what the energy is all right Let's figure out what the energy is, okay? And we'll let, so this will be 10 centimeters, there's 30 centimeters here, and then it'll depress it another 2 centimeters right here. Okay. All right. So there we go. The energy before equals is going to equal the energy after. Okay. So when I bring the spring down, this is going to be my zero. That's going to be my zero gravity. So or my zero reference point. So I'm going to have uh, what's the velocity when I bring this thing down of that spring? What's the velocity when I bring it down? Zero. Zero. What's the velocity when it depresses this spring all the way to the two centimeters? Zero. Zero. Ha ha! I don't have to worry about kinetic energy in this problem. Because you just told me that the before and the after was kinetic energy, zero. Cool. So Ke equals zero. Ke Great. Don't have to mess with that guy. Now, what's my What's my, if I set my reference point as zero here, what's my gravitational potential energy on the E-naught part? Zero. So, MGH naught equals zero. Great. So what's my only energy on the, on the initial part? The one-half kx squared. One-half k point one squared. Great. What's that? Just the elastic potential. Yeah, just the elastic potential. Because we set, well, we could say, well, that's, uh, uh, we could have said, if we'd have set this at zero, we could have said, well, it's uh, plus mg of negative 10. Eh, why mess with it? Just make this guy zero. Then we're good. All right. Now, equals this equals now when this block gets smushed up here 
okay, and it's smushed up here, and I've got the block, it's right here at this height, okay, it's right there at that height, all right, now then, it's got a final height. What would be its final height? Exactly. 42 centimeters. So it's 0.42 meters. Okay? So the MGH final would be MG.42. Beautiful. Plus, it's got this spring depressed, compressed there, one half k times 0.2 squared. See? This was 0 0.1 times 9.8. So that actually equals 0 0.98 times 0.4. See, looky. It turned out to not be that bad. What were we after? K. What's the only missing variable? K. Piece of cake. If you just look at the different energy levels, break a problem down and look at the, the two energy le the different energy, what, what energy is taking place at that point, whether it's kinetic, potential, or elastic. That's all you have to worry about right now. After the test, we'll have to worry about rotational. That's no big deal. That's just one half I, little omega, which is the rotational speed. You all had that in the lab, I think. Didn't you get omega was 2 pi over t? No. Don't worry about it then. That's this little omega. That's a rotational thing. Or I, th I think it sounds like kind of the, the love child of 50 Cent and Little Kim. It's a little omega. Anyway, sorry. All right. New rapper. One of like little Bow Wow. All right. All right. Okay, let's see. That's a good one. Now, let's do problem 76. We're going to throw a 1.2 kilogram ball is projected straight up. Oh, free fall problems. Everybody's favorite. You guys love these. But with energy, you're going to see with energy, it's much easier. It's a much easier problem. We can e actually deal with real world stuff here. Because in this problem, I love this problem because it does this. And we'll take the quiz here as soon as we get this one done. It says, a 1.2 kilogram ball is projected straight upward with an initial speed of 18.5 meters per second. Okay. Throwing mass is equal to uh, 1.2 kilograms. Notice they gave me a mass. So we're probably going to have a uh, non-conservative force like air resistance take place. It says, and it's got an initial velocity of 18.5 meters per second, meters per second. And it says, hey, it only went to a maximum height, h equals 14.7. It says, the question is, show numerically that total mechanical energy is not conserved in this case. Let me put this little final height there. That makes all the difference in the world. Because E naught equals, supposedly equals E final. So let's see. So you go, okay, E naught, does that equal E final in this case? Well, my initial... Um, my initial gravitational potential energy, I'll just set, the, set it at zero wherever I let the ball go. That'll be my zero, okay? And then I've got this. I've got my kinetic energy, which is one-half mv naught squared equals, does it equal mgh final? Uh, well, this side is equal to 1 times 1 1.2 times 18.5 squared. And this side is equal to 1 1.2 times 9.8 times 14.7. And what we will find out is this is 205 joules, and this is only 173 joules. So they're not equal. So their next question is, 
The next question is this. What's the work that air resistance did? What's the work of air resistance? I think that's a nice little question. Air resistance. Air resistance. The French resistance. Okay, air resistance. Okay, so it's the air resistance. How would we find the work done by the air resistance? It's real easy. You got two numbers up here. What are you going to do with them? Yeah, find the difference. Exactly, because when you have the because air resistance is a non-conservative force. Okay. Things depend upon path. In other words, it's, it's kind of like friction. In fact, it is friction. All right? Um, it's just air friction. All right? And so we got non-conservative force is equal to E final minus E initial. So in this case, it's 173 minus 205 equals negative 32 joules. Does that make sense? that it's negative, in other words, it's taking energy out of the system, so it's not going back up to where it was originally? Sure. Makes all the sense in the world. If you, you got to kind of sit back over the weekend and think about it, but it sure makes sense. And guess what we can do? We can figure out the acceleration, too, of the air resistance. Okay. And here's how we do it. We know that there's a force acting on this ball. F equals ma. F equals ma. F times distance equals work. So ma times distance, which was 14.7. We know the mass. We know the distance. We can set it equal to the work. Boom. We're there. We figure out the acceleration caused by the air resistance. Not also, and then we'll add that to gravity and it all works out in the end. Okay? So in other words, find the acceleration. Well, that's not bad. You just go, okay, mass times acceleration times the distance that it went is equal to negative 32 joules. So I take the acceleration is the negative 32 joules divided by the mass times the distance, and I wind up with like negative 1.8 meters per second squared. That's not the only, yeah, Eric, but it's negative. It, well, here's what I did. Mass times acceleration times distance is equal to negative 32 joules. And so we wound up with the acceleration in is negative 32 over 1.2 times 14.7. And that gives us a negative 1.8 meters per second squared. Now, that's not the only acceleration. You've also got gravity at negative 9.8 going down. So you add the two together, and you wind up with negative 11.6 as the acceleration. Because you could go back to our old problem and go, well, what is, OK, so if I've got an initial velocity, what is the acceleration? If it goes to this height, and the final velocity would be what? Zero. You could go, well, all right, so. 0 equals 18.5 squared minus 2a times 14.7. And when I find that a, I get 11.6 negative, well, this one, had, we just, since this is our magnitude thing, found out that the magnitude is 11.6 meters per second. If I add that 1.8 to 9.8, I get 11.6. So it's adding extra acceleration against the air molecules. Whew! If you understand this one and that one, you've got chapter 5 cold for the most part. And don't forget, work equals force times distance. Well, we had force times distance thrown in on this one, too. So if you got this one, this one, and the roller coaster, chapter 5 is golden. You're good. Okay, now, let's go ahead and take our little quiz. It'll just take a minute. Oh, I forgot to tell you about power. Gosh dang it. But it's not on the quiz. So I'll tell you about power. Uh, well, you got homework assignment. Well, I'll tell you about power next Tuesday. 
This, I, I spent too much time on. I gave you guys more problems than I gave the afternoon. But I want to make sure you get your points for showing up on this cold, rainy night. And this is quiz nine, right? Okay, I've got to hit this thing. I used to give breaks when I teach this class, but what I found happening was as soon as I just sit there. So I was like, okay, well let's just try and plow on through and get done early then. Uh oh. Is this working? Don, did you break it? No. Okay. Because you don't want to take it. It's working now? Green lights flashing? All right. All right, all right. More caffeine. That's what I need. Okay. I'll open sesame. Documents. Okay. Slideshow, view show. Oh, we're ready. Here's quiz nine. Professionally displayed again. All right. Here you go. You lift a book with your hand in such a way that it moves up at a constant speed. Where it is, while it is moving, what is the total work? What's the net work done on the book? Constant speed. You can talk among yourselves. Is it A? mg times r is it b force the hand times r what's r <laughs> Come on. hey what's r here yeah but what's our what's the answer the net work done constant velocity Eric, what, what, what are you saying? Zero. Zero. He might be right. I don't have the solutions to this because I came up with a different quiz and put the uh, long story. Long story. But typical, I need a secretary, but I don't rate. Okay. All right, so here we go. So that's question one. All right, now, by what factor? Oh, do we need an explanation for this? The two forces equal what? Well, what do the two forces add up to be? Zero. The two forces add up to be zero. So, the amount of work that this guy's doing, F times R, equals, is opposite the amount of work that this guy's doing, because he's F times cosine of 180 of R, because the displacement's going this way, the force is going that way, so he's negative. So, you got same positive work, plus the negative work is zero. That's what happens when you got a constant velocity thing going. Okay? The negative work equals the positive work, so the net work is zero. In other words, constant velocity, what's the change in kinetic energy? Zero, because V final equals V initial. Okay? All right. Good. So, by what factor? Okay. If I triple the speed, what happens to the kinetic energy? If you triple the speed, does so it go up by a factor of three, factor of six, factor of nine, factor of twelve? Yeah. Yeah, Tingy, are you giving Molly the answers today? No? Okay. <laughs> all right, good. You didn't give it last time, I know. She's just saying, is this all right? Yeah. Okay. What is, which one is it? Is it 9? 3V squared? Right, because it's 3V in parentheses squared. So it's 9V squared. Right, so it would be a factor of 9. 
because the one halves cancel out. So, all right, good. Ah, two stones are dropped. One twice the mass of the other from a cliff. Now we're talking about gravitational potential energy. Oh no, we're not. We're talking about the kinetic energy. One is twice as heavy. Mass. Okay. What is the kinetic energy of the heavy stone compared to the light one? One has twice the mass. I don't really like that heavy idea because heavy tells me weight. Yeah, it's still okay because we're on Earth, but I wish they had said more massive stone <laughs> instead of the heavy one. Okay, now we're, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the mass. So what would this do? Twice as much? It wouldn't be the same? What are their velocities when they hit the ground? No, 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 it's not nothing to do with air resistance. Their velocities are the same, correct? Then they hit the ground, but the masses are double. So one half mv squared if, if, one, if 2m and m, it's, it's double. It's not the squared one. Okay, good. All right, next one. Boom. Whoa, whoa, hold, hold up. Go back, stop. Oh, here you go. You need to see it. Their velocities are going to be the same when they hit the ground. Okay. Right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, so one half mv squared of the little guy, and we've got one half 2mv squared. So these twos cancel, and I've got one half mv squared and mv squared. <coughs> 50 cents a dollar. It's twice as much. Okay? Whereas the other one, we have 3v squared, which is 9v squared, so that makes it nine times bigger. Yeah, right, you did. No. No, I did. I had, oh, was it? Okay, here we go. All right, in the previous question, before hitting the ground, the final, oh. There you go. I'm saying it had more air resistance. Well, it did. So therefore, the, the little stone fluttered. They're the same. I can't get out of it. Because they don't give me a choice of the little stone fluttered, therefore. Okay. Child on a skateboard, okay, is moving at a speed of 2 meters per second. After force acts on the child, her speed is 3 meters. Blah, she speeds up. What can you say about the work done by the external force? Positive work was done, negative work was done, zero work was done. What can we say? Yeah, makes sense. Added energy. So she got faster. That makes sense. Yeah, it's like, oh yeah, those are easy. Give me springs bouncing up and down. That gets kind of difficult. Okay. Oh, this is a good one for potential energy. This is like my calculator floating all over the room. Okay. Two paths lead to the top of a big hill. One is steep and direct. This sounds like some kind of Zen question, doesn't it? Okay. Ah, grasshopper. Two paths lead off a hill. Okay. Okay, one is steep and direct. You know, when you can take the pebble from my hand, you may leave. But how much more potential energy would you gain if you take the longer path? Are they the same? We're talking potential energy. Are twice as much, four times as much, half as much? You gain no PE in either case. Okay, you're going up a hill. Are you going to at least gain potential energy? Yes. yes. Is it going to be what? Say it with conviction. Say it like you mean it. Can I get a witness? Yes. <laughs> it's the same. Right. All right. Sorry. A little call and response there. Okay. How does the work required to stretch a spring two meters, two centimeters, two meters, doesn't matter, Compare with the work required to stretch it one centimeter. <laughs> this is, which, which equation are we using now? One half kx squared, right. So, uh-oh, we're squaring things again. So what happens? Which answer is this one? Yes. 
That'll be four times because we're squaring the two. Good. All right. Ta-da. We're done. You may go out in the rain.